Hang out. What are some uh, what are some James. stuff that you want to talk about? Is there anything you want to talk about? Yeah. So I think like with the car thing. So I had um, like a 1990 car with my parents. I totally did. Totally. Nice. Yeah, I'm getting a new car. Um, and like I'm deciding the reliability versus like having I'm moving to Flint, so I want to have a reliable car in Flint and not. But I also like don't want to be the person pulling up to teach at a low income school with like a forty thousand dollar car. Yeah. So like, where is this bar? Of, well, this like, is the old. What, would you just drive a BMW? Yes. Right, kind of thing. Uh, there's like. So do you know who Tony Campolo is? Some of you, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. He, somebody asked him this question: Would you just drive a BMW? And like, let's assume that Jesus is like a 21st century like uh, uh, person, human. And uh, say, let's say that he has fifty thousand dollars, because that's what a BMW. Car, I think I honestly don't know what a BMW. Car. So you have to, buy, you do have to buy a car. You kind of have to have a car in this, unless you live in an urban context where there's public transportation. You kind of have to buy a car, right? So he would probably buy some sort of like, you know, decent car that actually works, you know, for like five, six, seven thousand dollars, and then probably give the rest away. That seems, that seems to kind of be like a Jesus thing to do, you know what I mean? Uh, so what's stop, why? Why get a car payment? Yeah. Why do it? I mean, if you, if, you, um, if you need a car payment to like buy your five or six thousand dollar car, then perhaps that's something to do, but why would you ever buy more than a five, maybe ten thousand dollar car? I have no idea why you would ever do that. There's so many better things to spend your, in my, look, you're only gonna get, I, you're just gonna get my opinion, but there's so many better things. We have one car as a family. It's got 240,000 miles on it, <laughs> and it gets us to the same place that a Maserati does. You know what I mean? And guess how much our car costs? Nothing, because it's got 240,000. The other day, uh, some lady hit our car. And I don't care. <laughs> and that's a liberating thing. I'm a beekeeper, I haul bees in it. My kids are like, they're like, there's bees flying around the car. I mean, it doesn't matter because it's just a tool. It's just a tool and those things don't matter. Like why not give, why not like have that money extra that you can give to stuff that's exciting to give to? Whether that's the church or charity organizations or a school or something. I don't know, to me like, it's just a tool. I would never spend money on a car. I don't spend money on cars. You know, I hate it. It's like a diminishing, or I really hate spending money on a car. And I get it, like, well, I'm a car guy. Okay, well, I mean, I'm a millionaire kind of guy. I would love that. <laughs> like, everybody would like a nice car, but it's just like, well, I just don't fully understand if money isn't the end. If money isn't the tell loss. I don't really get the ethics in getting a nice car. A reliable car is different than, like, there are lots of reliable cars that, whatever. Any other, yeah. Can you talk about, um, you're talking about a car, but like, what about the difference between like, renting a house and buying a house? Well, that's a tough, so there are good reasons to go. So uh, a house is what is considered an appreciating value. Um, so it's not depreciating like a car. Well, you can buy some houses that are lemons or something, but it's not, <laughs> if you buy like a normal-ish house, it will typically appreciate in value. It probably appreciates in value, even on like good markets at like, I mean, when you factor in costs and what have you, maybe two or 3% a year or something like that. So it's not like a money maker, but it's not, you're not losing money on it. So buying a house, owning a house is always a good idea because like eventually if you ever pay off a house, then you have all sorts of like extra income that you don't have to pay. That now it's like, it's like somebody's paying you money to live there on some level. You're paying yourself technically to live there, right? So, but you know, renting is not a bad thing to do. If, people, if you guys are probably all gonna be transient and um, you're not really, you know, stable and know where you're going and stuff like that. So and there's no, certainly no ethics wrong. Now I think there is something unethical in buying like some sort of mansion, for sure, um, because a lot of people are what's in a practical sense. A lot of people are what's called house poor. Uh, you heard that term before, house poor. So you get it. My friend uh, is in Kentucky. He owns this like electric business thing, and he wires up all these kind of rich homes. And he says like half the rich homes that he goes into, that are like you know six, seven thousand square foot homes or something like that. They have, um, uh, they're like half furnished because people want this big home but can't afford to live there. Um, yeah, being house poor seems to be like a ridiculously dumb idea as well too. <laughs> there is a liberation in having less stuff. So I was talking to this Amish guy, uh, <laughs> uh, and he, wrote, he uh, we were talking about like um, kind of life. A lot of life. I'm thinking about converting to Amishness 
<laughs> Mostly for the child labor aspect of it. Like, you're like, legitimately get my kids out there working. <laughs> but I was talking to this guy, and he said, like, he's got less, they have less stuff, right? They have less decisions they can make because of less stuff. But he says, I wake up in the morning, and I have two outfits. I have my Sunday outfit, and I have my weekday and, you know, Saturday outfit, right? I have two, two things. So I wake up in the morning, and I don't have, I can't make any decisions. Like, it's like, I'm wearing this this morning. And he says, that is a liberating idea for me because that's space that I don't have to occupy in my mind because honestly, all, all of us sit there in front of the, like the closet or whatever, like for me, like a Tupperware tub, you know, I'm like, what am I going to wear today, you know? <laughs> and uh, we sit there and we look at that stuff and it takes time. Well, you don't have to do that if you have one outfit that you're going to wear. So obviously that's an extreme version, but having less stuff is actually more of a liberating experience. It, it truly is a liberating experience. The more stuff you have, you're like, am I going to drive the Maserati or the BMW? Like, I don't know. The 240,000 mile Honda. Yeah. Yeah, so like when, so I'm getting married next summer, like graduating, all that fun stuff. And my grandparents on one side, they're like, you have to buy a house. Like the month after your graduation, like that's what you have to do when you're this age. Because I think that that's kind of where they were yeah. at. And then my parents are like, even if your student loans are due, like you need to start paying that back. And I think like a lot of people have these different ideas of like priorities. So whether that's your personal experience, or, like your opinion after survival, like what do you think are those things that's like, <laughs> yeah. we need to get this done. Uh, I think being in debt is like the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. Um, it's that you can become a slave to debt. So especially if you're getting married, so you're gonna have, you know potentially have two incomes. I mean, what me and my wife did. My wife has always worked part time. She's never worked full time. But we would live off of my salary. Um, and I was a pastor for like four years, so I was making I think twenty thousand dollars a year or something like that. So we would live off of my salary, and then hundred percent of what she made, we would just pay off debt with. And if you'd be surprised, especially if you have a double income like that, how quickly that can happen. Now that's harder if you're single income or something like that, but you can kind of live off of, try to live off a little bit less and pay off debt that way. Um, I mean, I think that buying a home just depends on how much money you have. So we paid off our debt before we like uh, bought you know, a home with a mortgage or whatever. So just because uh, we want, I don't know, we just wanted to do that first. So. But I mean, it depends if you're if you know you're gonna be somewhere forever. Then I could see the kind of I could see doing that. But I mean, frankly, from a practical level, right now, like housing prices are pretty high. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they drop in a year or so. Like I, I would rent and pay off loans. That's what I would do personally. If I was if I were graduating now, that's what I would do. Become debt free as quickly as you can. Because then you can, you're just liberated. You can do anything you want to, and you don't have a house saddling you. You can move wherever. You can do whatever. And that there is some real beauty in that. And it provides like a social, you know, uh, or a security net where you don't have to kind of rely on, uh, you're not stuck because you, you know, you have a little bit of money to like live for a little bit while you find another job or whatever. So. That's, again, that's easier for people that are married with two people working, um, but it can happen by yourself as well too. I, th I think very much so. And it doesn't take a lot, again, I, you know, I was a pastor making like 20, I think it was 16,000 plus like $4,000 in education money or something like that that was going towards them. So you can, you don't, it doesn't take a lot to like live cheaply. So. Any other kind of thoughts about, yeah? Um, when you think about like the way that people, especially like in this culture, spend money and there's so many things that we're like, we need this, we need this, we need this. And it's not necessarily like some sort of like selfish, like I'm just something about myself, but there's just like a cultural need mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Um, what are a couple of things in that which like you would want to draw attention to and be like, no, like that's not an actual need, like this is a cultural need, Yeah. I guess. Sure, yeah. So like the question is like what what's an actual need and what are our our cultural needs and stuff like that? I don't think clothing is an actual need. Oh well, okay. So that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> like how how much clothing I don't think anybody should be buying clothing at uh, you should always be buying clothing at a second hand shop. Other I, anything else is is it really is it is kind of uh, vanity. It's like and we can kind of explain that away. Uh, underwear maybe might be an exception. So <laughs> but we can explain that away in, and that might be different, I suppose, if you need some sort of suit for your job or something. But, uh, but try to explain that in other terms that's not vanity. And I know that sounds extreme, but clothes are a tool. They're just functional. 
you know? So I don't think clothes is, I don't think we should be buying new clothes. I think that's a need that, and how much money do you, you save so much money if you don't buy new clothes? Mm -hmm. So much money. So uh, that's, I think that's an excess. I, and we don't live an austere life or anything like that. We, we go out to eat and do different things. I think you need some entertainment money or what some people call running around money. Otherwise, you're just gonna <laughs> blow through other money. You're gonna do it. You're gonna go out to eat, you're gonna go watch a movie, you're gonna do that stuff. So you need to kind of budget in some of that stuff. Um, budgets are good for that. Uh, I think another need, again, is like um, a fancy car or a second car if you can avoid it, you know? I think uh, another, or sorry, I think that that would be an excess. I think a genuine need is a place to live, you know? Um, food is obviously a genuine need, but not all kinds of food. You know, you don't need the best food, um, expensive food or whatever. I know this sounds contradictory, and you might, your, you know, your kind of faith tradition, you might get this, but <laughs> let your feast be feast and let your fast be fast. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're going to go out to eat with your friends, go out to eat with your friends and don't stress them about stress about them. But when you're fasting on things, or you're kind of being more <laughs> austere in like your, um, you know, housing and spending and your car, or this or that, or whatever, <clears throat> like do that well. And like you're not going to regret doing that well. And you do that well by always keeping in the forefront of your mind what is the telos. The telos is people, uh, the kingdom, you know, I think. Uh, charity organizations, nonprofit organizations like this or others. I think you know those things are telos things, entities. Um, the other stuff isn't. It just isn't. Yeah. Do you think the priorities change while we're in college and are either living off of our parents' money or the meager money that we get from working at the school versus <laughs> uh, salary-wise, like? We hardly have enough money to donate now. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think that like all all like money to donate, for instance, <coughs> takes sacrifice. Are you kidding me? Like, there's so many better. There are so many selfish things that I would love to do. Not love to do, actually, but like there's so many selfish things that I could do with money that like I might give away. Of course. And so I guess the question that I would ask you now is, what kind of habits are you developing to be a certain kind of person? Those habits that you like. What kind of tipper are you now? To waitresses and waiters, and what that's the same tipper you'll be when you're making fifty thousand dollars at your you know striker job. I love that name, striker. <laughs> you know, you know when you're working at striker or wherever, you know you're that you'll be the same tipper. So what patterns are you developing now? So I would ask you, I would flip the script on you and ask you the question: What are you sacrificing right now in order to be able to purposefully give away money? And if you're not doing that right now, you're probably not developing the habits enough to be able to do that when you're actually making money. Because you're just going to have bigger needs, like, oh, I was going to have kids, and they're in sports, and they're in this, and... So I think if you're not purposefully sacrificing now, then you, or not even sacrificing, but just reorienting your priorities to be teleological and not toilet logical, <laughs> you know, uh, reorienting your priorities, then if you're not doing, if you're not capable, of, if we are not capable of doing that now, at whatever stage we're at, we're not going to be capable of doing that when we're like better socioeconomically. I don't think. So you know, maybe that's like, hey, we always go out to a movie on Friday nights. I'm going to skip this Friday night in order to take six bucks or ten bucks, whatever a movie costs, and I'm going to purposefully buy some mosquito nets. And then you know, when they're at the movie and you're watching your parents' Netflix. You know that you're stealing. Uh, <laughs> you know you can. It, it feels good. There's a like altruism feels good, and that's okay. It's okay for it to feel good. It's okay for that to be a little bit self-interested. It does feel good. You know, and I would encourage you to do that as anonymously as you can. That's even more. I think it's even more. Fun. And then, yeah. How or where do we um, choose to pick like an ethical way for giving our money? How or where? Yeah. Yeah. So there's this there's this kind of myth that like, um, well, how do I know that the money's really going to the charity? You guys have heard that before. That's why nobody gives to like mosquito nets in Africa or something like that, right? <laughs> how do I know that the money's? You can know, right? This is the internet age. It's super easy. There are all sorts of third party entities that vet um, uh, charity charity organizations. All sorts of stuff like that. Or 
frankly, if you're if you're if you want to just, I think this is always a great idea, both in investing money and donating money. Is you invest or donate into stuff that you actually know. Mm -hmm. Like I know this organization, and I of course. Or I again, I'm not paid to do a sales pitch for Spring Harbor. I'm really not. I hope you know that I'm not. But like, if you've had a good experience here, I think this is a, a nice place to give money to because you know this place and you know the kinds of experiences that you're you're getting from it. Or you have a good experience at your church, um, and you're like, I know my church works with these great organizations out here in rural Kentucky, you know, trying to help them get food, or inner city Chicago, trying to help them kind of meet socioeconomic needs or something like that that you can donate to places that you know are actually doing good work. So I would say if you don't, first donate to the things that you know and are, and are personally invested in. And then second, there are just research tools if you want to go the kind of humanitarian routes and things like that, like Syrian refugee or mosquito nets or something. There are research tools out there if you search hard enough that will like vet um, those organizations. And frankly, I wouldn't do any organization that isn't vetted by some sort of the third party. Because there's funny money in charities, for sure. Yeah, Destiny. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, I know you said, like, you don't like, need the best food or, like, uh, things like that, but where does ethical spending that's way in for things like, if you want to buy fair trade coffee, but it's way more expensive than yeah. coffee, or, like, fair trade clothing. It's a tough one. Because it's, like, not Absolutely. trafficking. Or, like, yeah, yeah. All these different things, like, where is ethical spending? Yeah. <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I think that that money is money worth spent, actually. So fair trade coffee, fair trade clothing. Like if you're gonna buy clothing, like I think that's, I do think that's a, an okay place to, to do it. Um, but I think you do that with caution and not flippantly and not frequently. You know what I mean? So like, you know, you all know, I mean, you're all smart people, you're getting a good liberal arts education, so I, I would assume that you kind of figure this stuff out. But uh, Hershey's chocolate bar costs like a dollar or something. But it really costs three dollars. You're just stealing two dollars from the workers that make that coffee or that chocolate bar. You know what I'm saying? The actual cost is like three bucks, but you just don't pay them enough wages. So you're stealing those two dollars from them, and you're paying only a dollar for this Hershey chocolate bar, right? So I think when we look at some of the stuff that we take, food and and, and some clothing and stuff like that, the cost of the clothing and the food is actually higher than what it is. You're just stealing it from the workers. So. Yeah, we gotta buy food, and I think that's an okay place to spend money on. And, and some clothing, too. I think it's an okay place to spend money on. If you can buy used, it's even better. I mean, honestly, better to buy a non-fair trade thing used at, like, Goodwill, because it's already made, and it's right there, than have more, to spend something new on a fair trade, whatever. Used coffee tastes bad. <laughs> <laughs> clothing is probably a little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then how do you balance um, like trying to live ethically and trying to not let money be the telos, but at the same time not getting so worried and wrapped up in the money and trying to live ethically and feeling bad for not living ethically enough? Yeah. How do you find that balance? Yeah, well a little bit of shame and a little bit of guilt is okay, I think. Um, you know, that's what keeps honest people honest, you know. So I think that's okay. I don't I don't have a problem with that. Personally, uh, I think you balance it by all—I mean, always thinking about how can I, how can I make more money, how can I save more money, and how can I give more money. I think always you're never thinking about how can I give more money. You have to also be thinking about how can I make more money, how can I save more money. You're never thinking about how can I make more money. You're thinking about how can I make more money, how can I save more money, how can I give more money. You cannot think about those in isolated. I think we can't think about those in isolated events. That's just a money philosophy in general, right? And frankly, you're not going to make... <clears throat> Look, it's fun to find creative ways to give money. And it's also fun to find creative ways to make money. And it's also fun to, to see creative ways to like save money. Like I have like, um, personally, I have like a couple different bank accounts that I hide from myself. You know, in my own subconscious, you know? So like, I, you know, I, we're trying to save some money for different things and so I, you know, yesterday I just transferred money to this other bank account on this website that I never go on at all. So I just, that money's gone to me. It's just dead to me. You know what I mean? So you can save money by doing stuff like that and you don't have to like think about it. But uh, yet yeah, you can, you know what I'm saying? I try to do some side hustle jobs. Uh, <laughs> like, um, yeah, different, just different things you know, uh, to make extra money on the side. 
But I, I think that you're always doing that so that you can give the law away. And if you're not, then why? Why? I don't know. I don't know. John, I mean, John Wesley, like, he had a lot of faults for sure. Uh, but one of the cool things I think he did is he made a lot of money off of publishing some books and things like that. And uh, he he said, I want to die without a, 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 a pound in my pocket. A pound is like a rich dollar, right? I don't want, I want to die without one dollar in my pocket, you know? And it, I think he said even something further. He's like, if I die with one dollar in my pocket, call me a fraud and a liar. Or something like, that. like, shoot, that's how it should be, man. Give it, give it away. It's fun. It's fun to give it away, I think. But you don't, you don't give it away and you're like, sorry kids, you're not eating today because I gave away your food. Like, that's irresponsible and unethical. So how do you keep that balance? I think you keep that balance by always taking you know, all three of the save, earn, and give. You know. Any like other questions on like investing stuff or like what about investing? When do you do that or or uh, how, do, how does that ethically work? Yeah. Uh, I do think that depends on, she said, how, how do you distinguish between how much money to save and how much money to give away? I do think that depends on your need. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. That, I don't, I think that, uh, I don't think there's a way to like, put, I don't think there's a percentage you can put a number on that. Um, so, you know, earlier on in your life, I think you save a bit more because you don't know what's kind of coming down the pipeline. You know, especially if you have kids and different things. But I, you always have in the in the saving, you always have to be thinking: Am I developing the virtues and the habits of giving? Because you're not like come towards the end of your life or later in your life when you have a bit more money, you, you're not gonna you're just not gonna do it if you don't have that habit. You know. Developed, and so this is where I'm saying, like, I know it's, I know, I know what it's like to be in student debt, very much. I have had a lot of student debt, you know. And I know what it's like to like uh, make ends meet and rub nickels together and things like that. But like, you have to find creative ways to give now, or you're not going to develop those habits to give later. And that's just the truth. If you don't find, when you're tired, if you don't find creative ways to like get all sorts of things done when you're when you're tired and you're worn out and you're stressed you just when when life is easy you're not going to do that like if you can't have a prayer life in the the bad times why would you have a prayer life in the good times if you can't have prayer life in the good times why would you have it in the bad times so i don't think it matters where you're at because it matters what are you sacrificing what are you what are you what standards are you living up to kind of thing. so i do think that there are times in life stages in life where you're saving more trying to pay off debt or whatever but you you've got to give or else you won't have the habits of giving later and so I think that that waxes and wanes depending on like what are your means at that t at the time period. So, and any other stuff? Yeah. So at the beginning of this um, series, Randy Lewis came in and talked about retirement, saving for that. Um, can you talk about how like I don't know like kind of how much like how much do you need or something? How much do you need? Like how can you save like? Like sometimes it might feel weird if we're like <coughs> trying to keep this money away, but we actually have this like hidden pot like behind. Yeah, like, we're, like saving storing up in barns. Kind of right, things. which yeah. is like yeah. It's, it's well, here's the thing. So you, I think you're you're a fool if you're not saving for retirement on some level. You're gonna you're gonna get to a place that you're gonna retire. I would hope at some point. And retirement should look differently. I mean, hopefully you're working in retirement and what have you. So uh, yes, you save. And you and you and you and you invest in different ways, and there's lots of different ways to do that. But you have to give at the same time, and what that means is, if you, I think, I do think this, if you're if you are purposeful and teleological in your thinking, and you can say, like the point of money is to to uh, help uh, real people and real entities and the kingdom, then what happens, I think, when you're coming towards the end of your life? And you've saved for retirement, and you do have leftover to live off of, which I hope is the case for most of most of you. Well, all of you actually. I hope that's the case for all of you. I think it will probably be the case for most of you, <laughs> except for you. <laughs> right. uh, stop. Um, then, uh, I, I honestly, I, I hope my parents give me the zero at the end of their. I hope they just give it all away. Because if they've raised me well enough on some level, I hope that I don't need any of their help. You know what I mean? 
So like I I don't I don't plan on giving my kids a time. <laughs> so, certainly not Lucas. You know? <laughs> so I don't I don't plan on giving them because why? I hope them to be like stable enough and I hope to die late enough that they don't need it. Like if my parents die in twenty years, God willing, you know, not till then, you know, what I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, so I don't need their I don't I don't want to need their money. Give it away. So hopefully you've developed the habits enough by saving that that is just money that will be just given later. You know what I mean? So I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Um, although there, there can be arguments to be made in, for more extreme people or more people that are kind of more, uh, just kind of geared up to be more extreme, to just to not save at all and just kind of rely on the community that, of faith to kind of provide and help and stuff like that too. And I, and I, I think those are very valid arguments as well too. Um, but but it does take a community who's like caught all in on that, so you're not just kind of a dead weight. That's that's unethical as well, right? To be dead weight on your family or your community. So I, uh, you just really have to kind of be aware. But again, and I know this sounds like I'm being a dead horse, but if you, if you're doing the earning and the saving and the giving and you're developing those habits, I think some of these questions get figured out in the virtues that you've already developed, and they become easier decisions. Oh, of course I'm going to give to this. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I give to this? Because this is the kind of person that I've developed to be. Or like, why wouldn't I save for this? Because it's the kind of person that I'm being developed into. You know what I mean? And I do think those have to start now, you know? Yeah. Could you speak more about um, developing the habits or practices? Because like, when I hear, yeah, I don't know, a lot of these like virtues, like, yeah, like right, but then when it's like my turn, something like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> so how do you develop the habits of like giving and stuff? So, um, uh, so okay, so somebody asked, um, so th 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 I don't mean to keep talking about John Wesley, like I, you know, kind of love him and hate him, he's fine, I guess. <laughs> but he, he says, um, he had a time where he didn't have faith, and one of his uh, friends, Peter Bur Burler, asked, told him, he said, if you don't have faith, preach faith until you have it. And like, I think that's actually a good way of practicing the virtues and developing the virtues. If you don't have the virtues, let's say the virtue of generosity, for instance, is what we're talking about. Um, if you don't have the virtue of generosity, be generous until you develop the virtue of generosity. The only way to kind of develop the virtues is to practice the virtues. And I know what, like, which one's the cart, which one's the horse, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Because at some point, you're gonna look back and be like, oh, I just never, I guess I, I seem, I guess I, I guess I'm practice. I guess I'm being a generous person, without having to think about it, because you've practiced those virtues. It's sort of like I maybe mean, you played a sport or, like learning how to like if if you're right-handed, learning how to dribble a ball left-handed or something like that. At some point, you're like, oh, I guess I know how to dribble left-handed. You know what I mean? I was teaching my like my, my son. He's he's kind of a nerd, and he does like Rubik's cubes. <laughs> you know, nerd. <laughs> and, uh, he does these Rubik's cubes things. And it was so frustrating, and he would just practice, 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 and now he doesn't even like look at them when he does them, because it's just part of what he does. It's not frustrating because he practices those virtues. So, if you want to, if, honestly, if you want to be a generous person, just start being generous, and and do that systematically, habitually, and thoughtfully, and eventually you will be a generous person. If you want to be a, a more altruistic or caring, or um, compassionate or modest or whatever the virtue is. Just start practicing that. Start purposely doing that, and eventually you'll be that person. You know, there's no like shortcut to it. Steve Castle. <clears throat> so, you and Helen, I think, are on the same page with this stuff. So, what would you say for people that are getting married that are in totally different pages, or yeah. find themselves caring about this stuff ten years from now they're married? So they're not the same So, how do you? Yeah, I don't. I, so, yeah, like, what do you, what do you do if if um you're married and your spouse and you have like different kind of uh, orientations on like giving and money and virtue and things like that. Um, you, you can't convince anybody by words to like be a, a virtuous person or a more generous person or something like that. You, that's not something that can be like convinced. They have to see it and they have to see it in action and they have to believe that it is both efficacious and a better way to just live, you know? So I think that it, that's a hard that's a hard place to be, but I think all the more reason to double down on being a virtuous person to show that like and, and what you do is it's certainly the case of generosity, you'd be generous to that spouse, right? And and, and you show them like, look, even if you're against me, I'm gonna be for you on this. And now if they're like, look, don't spend our money this way, 
I don't know. You know, that's that's tough. I don't know. Certainly no marriage counselor, but I, I would think that there are probably bigger issues there than money. Money's probably the a, a frac like a, a straw on that kind of stack, I would think. So what are some ways that you have been teaching these, these principles to your kids, like in, in, in a practical way, like how are you showing them, how are you teaching them? Yeah, well, I don't know about showing them, well, showing them, we, we um, well, we try to show them in, I think, various different ways. Um, uh, that we that we have them take part in giving, what do you want to give to, and they kind of pick stuff. Um, we, show, we show them that there's a suffering of giving in that, like, you know, recently there was Halloween, right? So I took like 15% of their candy, you know? <laughs> like, hey, like, like, that's like life, you know? <laughs> um, we, we do make them, you know, when, when they earn, we don't, we don't ever give them money, they have to earn money. Uh, I think that's valuable. So they, when they earn money, and we pay definitely below minimum wage for stuff. Uh, they have to give away some of that. So they have to keep a third, give away a third, and um, save a third. And then they can buy fun things. And so they look, it's funny because like kids, they don't know. They're like, this is how it works. So they see themselves as like, sweet, I earned 60 cents for this instead of a dollar or whatever. Because I got to use 60 cents. You know, I'm gonna save the 30 cents. I don't know, do math, that's only 90 cents. But you get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> like I got to save this 33. And I get to spend this 33, and then the other 33 is just gone. And they get to figure out where they want to do that. So we have a little like coin jar thing that they put it in for stuff. So I think that there's ways to, to do that. But it doesn't come without a cost, and they want that whole thing. Because the key is you don't just give them like 66 cents. You give them 99, and then make them give away 33. And they're like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, nobody wants to, but at some point you will, and you'll think that's fun. And it, it is fun. And there's honestly more, there can be a lot of, I think there can be a lot of joy in that. So like, oh, is, is giving like selfish then because you're doing it for yourself? Who cares? Sure, okay, call it stuff, fine. Let's call, let's make a difference between self-interest and selfishness. You happen to get pleasure from giving or something like that, but like, yeah, it does feel good. You know, Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross and getting worship for all of eternity, does that getting worship feel good? Yeah, probably, but it's still probably good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like just because you have self-interest things that happen to you, does not mean it's inherently bad. If your motive is like, I want to be generous, and then, so I think that can be a very positive thing. Any other questions? You guys feel pretty good?